you, Simon. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Yeah, it's good to see you guys. Uh, this is our, our pre-load uh, shedding crowd here. Um, you know, load shedding is really, you know, getting our family, you know, hitting us quite hard at home. Uh, have you ever just run out of electricity and thought it was load shedding? You know, like three hours into it, you're like, oh, I think we're just out of electricity on the, on the meter. Uh, we've been there this week and last week for quite a few times. So um, anyway, I'm glad that you're here. I'm actually really, really happy that you're here. Most of the time, I'm very happy today. I'm extra very happy that you're here because we started this thing last week, this series called, called Fight For It. And if you weren't here last week, I can sum it up for you, you know, quite easily. But where this has come from is this has been a, a burden and something that God put on my heart as I took time to think about and pray for you. When I say I, I think about and I pray for the church, that means you that are in here sitting here with us right now. And God put it on my heart that, hey, Chris, this is the year that you guys are going to go out and you guys are going to actually go and you're going to fight for it. And so that doesn't mean that we're picking fights at the robots or the ATMs. You know, when somebody's got like nine deposits to make at an ATM, right? And they're doing all the phone numbers. They put the phone number in, deposit. And so there's one person in front of you, but, you know, 45 minutes later, you're still standing there. I'm not saying that that's the person we're going to go and pick a fight with and get into a fight with. Instead, it's much more significant. We're going to be fighting for ourselves and fighting for each other. So throughout this whole series, as I say these words, this is the year that we're going to fight for it. What that means is this is the year that we don't sit back and watch what happens in our lives. We don't watch our marriages do well or do poorly. We don't watch our friends do well or do poorly. We're not going to watch the loss just go out there and kind of live, you know, the life that they're living. We're not just going to watch that happen. Instead, we're going to be active. We're going to actually go out and we're going to fight for what matters. So does your marriage really matter? Yes. So we're going to go, we're going to fight for that. Do the lost really matter? That's what's so important to me right now is, is people that, you know, and when I say the lost that matter, You know, the Bible talks about being found by Christ. I was once lost, but now I am found. And so for me, I want to see those that don't know the love of Jesus come to know the love of Jesus. And that should have a profound impact on what happens here and what this looks like here on a Sunday morning. But if I truly, as the person leading this church, if I truly believe that the Jesus thing is the best thing for your life, then I have to be also bothered by all of the people out there that do not have the Jesus thing, correct? So I can't say that Jesus is the best thing for you and then be okay with people that don't have the Jesus thing in their life. And so I, I am burdened for the people that aren't in here. So this is the year that we go, we fight for those people. Some of you are here today because somebody fought for you. You were lost, you were sad, you were destitute, your relationships were bad. Something was going on and you were not found. You were seen, you were cared for by somebody, somebody fought for you. And because of that, you're here, your marriage is still together, your relationships are still together, family's been healed, you've recovered from an addiction, you've overcome, uh, you know, you've overcome things that you probably shouldn't have been able to overcome and that has happened because you've had people that gathered around and they fought for you. So that's the church that we are this year. That's who we become. And so in this four weeks through February, starting last week and then you know, moving throughout the month, we're learning how to fight. And the first step to learning how to fight, we talked about last week, lesson one was, was this, was that, that we are going to have to first decide and choose. So you can't get into a fight that you don't decide that you're going to take the fight. If, you, you can't say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and win if I don't first make the choice to fight. You know, if you don't take action, then it's just like what I call a shower conversation or a shower thought. It's that thing you think about doing when you're in the shower by yourself. And it's easy to win those fights or those battles or those conversations because no one's talking back to you. But for you to go out and actually to to fight, to do it, you have to make the decision to do it. And in fact, this is so important. If you can't decide... If you can't decide, if you can't make the decision to decide to fight, then there is no victory to be won. Not only is there no victory, 
but there's also no loss. And so we, we looked at a guy last week named Benaiah, and he made the decision to fight a lion. And we talked about what are the lions in our lives, the strongholds, the things that circle our camp, the things that threaten us, that we need to say, you know what, I'm no longer going to let this circle and pick off the easy prey of my life. Instead, I'm going to go out, I'm going to trap this lion, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill it. I'm going to fight my lions. And then on Wednesday night, yeah, I was so blown away. We had about 80 people here on Wednesday night for our, our fight night for groups. And that, and that was fantastic. And no one fought. No one had to fight anybody. If you're new, if you're unsure, we don't put anyone on the spot. We came. We had uh, biscuits. We had tea, coffee. I spoke for a few minutes. We got into groups. People talked. And then it was over. It was done at 8 o'clock. Very non-confrontational. So if you didn't get a chance to come, please come this Wednesday. But we shared our story about, you know, the fights that we were trying to get into, the fights that we were going to take, that we were going to, uh, you know, engage with. And this, this thing kind of came up a, a couple times. And it definitely came up in Casey and I's life this week. This, I mean, if you say that, hey, I'm ready to get into a fight, I'm going to fight for my marriage I'm going to fight for my kids, my relationships. I'm going, to, I'm going to pick this fight. And if you say that, but you're not ready for it, then there is a brutal reality coming. And in fact, this week, and maybe you can identify with this, Casey and I, we feel like we've just been punched in the face this week. You know, we, we, we kind of feel like that there's just been this, like, out of nowhere, this left hook that's got us. And that's okay. We're okay with that. And we are Okay, so no one, you don't need to call and, and uh, think that we're disintegrating because we're not. But, you know, I, I spoke with people this week that also said, you know, I'm afraid to take the fight because I, I don't want to get punched in the face. So I'd rather just not take that fight. Or, you know, th this is a big deterrent to, to say, you know, I, why, why mess with something when it's not really broken? I can continue to kind of just get through these things, why should I really poke at it? We have a saying called, uh, don't poke the bear. You guys don't have bears here, you have lions. So you also wouldn't want to, don't poke the lion. Don't poke mom before coffee, right? Can you identify with that there? But the idea is like, don't, don't walk around poking that dangerous thing. And asking ourselves, do we want to pick a fight and make our lives better? It's kind of like poking the bear, and we're afraid to poke the bear because we're afraid we're going to get hit in the face. And the, the reality is you probably will. I mean, we did. It's okay to take a couple blows uh, to the nose. You, know, you, you, know, you don't know what kind of person you are until you've been you know, hit in the face at least one good time. There's a marriage building exercise for you today. You don't know. Don't do that. Don't go hit each other in the face. That actually is really bad. Don't do, we don't condone that at all. But, but you... You, you may feel punched in the face this week. You may feel punched in the nose. And then on, on top of that, if you've taken the fight or maybe you're afraid to, you're afraid to face this punch. You know, there's also another thing that we, it's really scary. If you've decided to fight, it's easy to feel punched in the face, but then it's also easy to feel like you're in a, an unwinnable battle. And so it kind of feels like I am this person and I'm up against, now that I've decided to fight this battle, I've now realized that this battle is way bigger than I was prepared for. And I've realized that I'm, it's me against a million, me against just unwinnable, unsurmountable odds. And I, I don't know if I can overcome that. Or I, I don't know if I can achieve. And then... What this does to us is this also, again, deters us. If we've decided to fight that battle, then you can put that picture back up there, guys. If we've decided to fight the battle, and then we find out that we're up against this army, then it's, it's okay, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have picked that fight. Maybe I shouldn't have taken a step towards that battle. Maybe I should not have done that. And I just want to encourage you, like, you know, if you feel punched in the face, if you feel like you're up against an unwinnable battle, I don't want you to give up, or I don't want you to think that you've chosen the wrong battle to fight here. Now, I'll tell you about unwinnable battle 
in, in, uh, in my life that I was fighting up against. And if you've been here for a while, you, you know a lot of this story. But, you know, for me, I remember an unwinnable battle was when I chose to fight the battle against depression and anxiety. And this is before Casey and I were here at this church. And what felt unwinnable, it made me feel like this person here was not, uh, I'm going to fight for a cure against depression and anxiety. It was, I'm going to fight to stay alive against depression and anxiety. And there were many, many days that it felt like an unwinnable battle. And every day, every moment, every breath was like getting, you know, punched in the face. Well, I'm here to tell you, I mean, the fact that I am here now is a testimony that you may think it's an unwinnable battle, but it is winnable. We can win this battle. You can win whatever you think your unwinnable fight is. Whatever you stepped into last week and realized that you're in too deep now and you don't want to be there and you'd rather just walk out and leave it alone. Whatever that is, it's okay to be there. Stay in there and let's work through this because it's not an unwinnable battle. I promise you that. And I, and I, I watched in my life over time, you know, I just took ground gradually. Took a little bit of ground, a little bit of ground. So I conquered more, conquered more, overcame more, overcame more, became a winner more and more and more. And that battle is won. It's completely won. So I, I can tell you that that's just as possible for you as well. In fact, I, I thought there's no better way to illustrate this fact than to kind of open up your eyes to something, to, to an event that happened in the Bible and it is a real eye-opener. And if you know the story, you know, you'll see that, yeah, okay, this is, that's a fun, like, play on words there. But this is the story of exactly that. A battle was fought, a battle was picked, a fight was picked. And what looked like a completely unwinnable situation ended up being easily winnable. Because there was something that was happening in the background there that continues to happen in our background. We just aren't aware of it. We just haven't tapped into it yet. So I want to tell you about a prophet named Elisha. So I call Elisha the, the double portion prophet, and here's why. In the Bible, there's two prophets in the Old Testament. And when I say a, a prophet, these were the guys that sort of interceded between God and Israel. So Israel, the nation of people, they would hear from a prophet and they would kind of go to God and the prophet would come back and say, okay, nation, here's how you need to act or behave or what you need to do, who you go to war against, who you don't go. But they were guiding the nation. But Israel often, they didn't pay any attention to this. And so a prophet was kind of like uh, a, a really disgruntled babysitter who could not get the kids to obey. And Elisha, not Elisha, but there was one before Elisha called Elijah, E-L-I-J-A. And he was a prophet who did these amazing things. He set uh, an altar on fire. They poured water on it. And the fire continued to burn. He, he did a lot of incredible things. And there came a, a time where he had this apprentice, Elisha, who was following him around, trying to learn from him, trying to figure out how to do this prophet thing. And he becomes a pretty good apprentice. And now it's time for Elijah. His time in life is coming to an end. And he, he goes a different way than us. See, when our time is over, we lay down, we die, it's over, it's done. We had a death in our family. Uh, our dog, Kaya, um, after 12, 13 years, we had to put her down uh, a couple weeks ago which meant that we had to begin the conversation with Benjamin, our almost five-year-old, on what, heaven, what is heaven? You know, who, who goes to heaven? When is mommy going to heaven? When's daddy going to heaven? Is Kaya in heaven? But where it started with is I came home to pick Kaya up and take her to the vet, and Benjamin looks at me, and I just feel like this is kind of like God's sense of humor. Benjamin looks at me, and he says, uh, Daddy, Kaya's going to die right now, isn't she? Um, yeah, and he goes, she'll be dead, right? And I'm like, yeah, you know, she will. And he was just very, like, matter of fact about it. And then he just said, well, we're just going to bury her in the ground. And, we're, you know, we're like, 
okay, no, she's going to go to heaven. And then, he said, then it really, it would have been easier to have not told him about heaven and just said that when dogs die, you bury them in the ground and you move on with it. But we started talking about, well, yeah, you know, they go to heaven and there's this heaven place. And, and then he says, well, I'm ready. If heaven's that great, can I go to heaven? We're like, no, that's, you can't do that. That upsets people. You don't get to make that choice. God makes that choice. So this whole big conversation evolved out of that. So there's been a lot of theology in our house lately. But Elijah didn't have to go that route. He went a different route. And it's, it's quite amazing. So let's look into it here. And Elisha, his apprentice, is there for the whole thing. So this is Elijah and Elisha together. And it's Elisha is about to die. He's about to let go of his life. And he says in verse 9 in 2 Kings chapter 2 is where you find this. And he said, when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, they've crossed the river, the Jordan. He says, hey, Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. So he's, what would you like done before I leave? And Elisha looks at him and he says, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now what he's asking for there, this is very, very interesting. He's not asking for twice as much of Elijah to be put on him. He's not saying all the good that you have, I want twice as much of that. Or he's also not saying... I would like twice as much of your blessing to be put on me. See, in the Bible, the firstborn got the double portion of the inheritance. So the inheritance went to the firstborn. All the other kids would also get stuff, but the firstborn got the first portion. He got the double portion. And so when Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit, he says, I want your inheritance. I want to inherit your relationship with God, the anointing that's on your life. I want to be the firstborn, the inheritance of what you are passing down. And, and that's a significant thing for him to ask for. And so after he says that, Elijah responds and he says, okay, you've asked for a difficult thing here. However, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So he says, if you can hang around long enough to see me taken from you, then you can have it. So he's, he's, he's daring Elisha, see this thing through to the finish. Because if you don't see this thing through to the finish, then you don't get what's at the finish line. And then what ends up happening with him as the, the scripture continues is that there's a, a, a moment where these chariots of fire that they come down. And these chariots of fire, they, they come down and they grab Elijah and they take him away in a whirlwind. And Elisha is there with him. In fact, a couple times Elijah had tried to knock Elisha off, like, don't follow me, go away, go away. And Elisha said, nah, not today, sucker. I am not leaving your side because I want what I asked for. And he was there all the way to the end. And so Elijah is one of the people in the Bible that never died. Enoch was that way. Elijah now, he, he gets to experience this. And so he's alive. And then chariots of fire come down. They take him up into a whirlwind. And then he's gone. In fact, all the, the, the servants and the assistants to the prophet, they went to Elisha and they said, let us go look for him. And he says, he's not there, guys. And they said, well, you know, let us just, let, can we go look anyway? Yeah, guys, he's not there. You're wasting your time. Come on, he's somewhere. Let's go look for him. They never find him. Elisha's like, I told you so. Because he was taken up into heaven. And so in verse 15, when the sons of the prophets who were watching opposite at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and they bowed down to the ground before him in respect. And so now here we have the story, the beginning of the story of this man that we're going to follow through a couple events in his life. He was, a, he was an apprentice to a prophet. He dared to ask for something so bold as the inheritance. He fought to stay with Elijah so that he could get it and receive it. And then he received it and he started to walk in it. 
In fact, he does about 10 amazing miracles once he becomes the prophet for Israel. Look at what he does here. So first of all, this is the list of 10 here that he does. Before he even gets recognized as the prophet, he grabs Elisha's cloak that fell on the ground and he strikes the river with it and the river splits and he walks across on dry land. That's before anyone even knows that he's the guy and Elijah is actually gone. Then he goes to Jericho and they have messed up water and he heals the water. He, 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 gets, he uses bears as a weapon. This guy was walking down the road and some, some kids, it calls them youths, but they were, would have been in their like early 20s, mid 20s. They start harassing and making fun of him. You know what he does? He calls God to call bears. Bears come out of the wilderness and eat the kids. Yeah, that's hardcore, man. That's like, think about that. That's, a re that's real. That's a deal. I went down a deep hole figuring this out. Where did this happen? Do bears exist there? When were bears found? And it's like, yeah, everything's pointing right to that there. So you guys make fun of me again, and we'll see what, you know, <laughs> see what happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, I grew up with bears. I just speak their language. But he uses that. He's, this, this is the kind of thing he does. He, he, again, he heals the Moabites' army's water. This army had no water. He, he cleans the water. There's a widow that is desperate for money. She's about to actually let her life go. And he, he does a miracle and he multiplies her oil. The Shunammite's son is a story about how he helps raise a kid from the dead. And he does it in such a weird, weird way. If you know the story then great. If you don't, look it up in 2 Kings. I think it's chapter 2. It's super weird, but he does it. And I'm not going to tell you how so that you're motivated to go read it, but it is a weird story. But this kid breathes life again. This is a woman that built a room for him and hosted him. Her son dies. He helps raise her from the dead. He goes on. He heals some poison stew. Invite him over today for lunch, right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> Got some poison stew at home. Not my house. Food in my house is great. He feeds 100 people. And then there's a guy named Naaman. Naaman was a general in the opposing army who had leprosy. And he heals Naaman. Naaman comes looking for, for healing. He's like, you know, hey, I'm looking for this guy, Elisha. You know, yes, we're about to wipe your people off the face of the earth. But I want to know if you can heal me. I hear that you can. Elisha, through his servant, uh, ends up getting Naaman healed. And then there's this crazy story of an axe head that he makes float. It's a piece of iron that uh, gets lost. A guy's cutting a tree down. If you don't think God cares about those lonely moments with you in the workshop or, or broken down the side of the road with your car or fixing something, God does care. In a lonely moment, a guy's cutting a tree down, the axe head flies off and it sinks to the bottom of the water. Elijah comes up and he says, I borrowed that. Like, and iron was crazy expensive. It, iron would have been a real, real, real important commodity. Elisha throws a stick in there. God's like, the stick floats, but uh, where's the, oh, there it is. Axe head floats right up to the stick. So th this is the kind of prophet that he is. He, he is walking around just, he has the double portion of God on him. He's got that double blessing. He's got the, the, the spirit. And through that, God's using him. And God's going to use him in these last two miracles that we're going to talk about here for the rest of this message. And the first one is, is that Elisha foils the, the Syrian army. So this is what's happening with, with Israel here. I hope it's not too in the weeds here. Are we following? Okay. So basically, if you're not following, you've got Elisha didn't die. Elisha inherited his superpowers. God gave him superpowers. He walks around and he does eight really cool superpower things. And then now, Elisha, the prophet of Israel, who holds you know, the relationship between them and God, Israel is not obeying. He's the babysitter and Israel is disobeying. And so God is telling Elisha, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish these people. They're going to get a spanking. But what that means is I'm going to you know, let half of them die, be overtaken by another country but not quite yet. So then there's this other army, the Syrian army, and the Syrians are gonna be used by God to teach Israel a lesson and to kind of wipe them out. And so they start, 
their process of attacking Israel. But it's not time yet. And so Elisha does this really annoying thing for King Ahab, the king of Syria, where every time the king of Syria is trying to make a move on Israel, Elisha is telling the king of Israel what's about to happen. And so Ahab's like, how do they always know what's happening here? I must have like a spy in my company. And look, look at how this plays out here. In 2 Kings uh, chapter 6, you've got the king of Aram, Syria. This is the guy that wants to kill Israel. He was making war against Israel, trying to wipe them out. And he consulted with his servants saying, my camp shall be in such and such a place. Basically saying, this is where we're going to move and where we're going to go and how we're going to conquer them. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel. So that's Elisha, the man of God. He sends word to the king of Israel. And he says to them, he says, be careful. Don't pass by this place because the Armenians are pulling back to there. He said, stay away from this. This is where the Syrian army is going to be. Then the king of Israel sent word to that place about which Elisha had warned him. So he guarded himself there repeatedly. So it's happening a lot over and over and over again. And so then the king starts to maybe get a little bit upset here because in verse 11, now the heart of the king of Aram, the bad guy, the Syrian king, he is enraged over this thing. And if you think about it, he's moving an entire camp of people. It's not like getting in your car and driving to a different location. There's no like Uber for warriors. Like he's got to put the fires out, pack up the tents, move thousands and thousands of people, get somewhere and find out that his plan's been foiled in front of him. So he's mad. So he calls his servants to them. And this, I, for me, is kind of funny. Uh, I think it would be funny, not for them, funny for me. But will you not tell me which of us is helping the king of Israel? So this is where he says, like, okay, which one of you, which one of you is telling the king of Israel what we're about to do? Because the only people that know what we're about to do is you guys. And I'll be honest with you. If I'm one of those guys, one of those servants, immediately I'm going to say he did it. He did it. Yeah, yeah, he did it. Yeah, it was him. Heard it. Heard it last night. Heard it this morning. You know, was afraid to tell you about it, but he did it. I'm going to throw everyone under the bus. All right, because there's no way out of this situation. The king's going to kill somebody because there's no way for, every, for, for their plans to get foiled over and over and over and over again. So they respond differently. They respond as a unit. They had obviously talked about this. One of his servants says, none of us is helping him. None. Okay. None of us are doing it, my Lord, but it's that Elisha guy. Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So then the king says, okay, I can believe you. Do you want to know why he could, this is why he could believe this. Because the guy that came before Elisha was Elijah. And he had a history of messing with this king, constantly foiling his plans. This king hated Elijah so much. So when the king hears that the spirit of God has gone to Elisha and it's Elisha doing it, he's like, okay, it makes sense. I get it. Let's go get him, guys. Let's go get him. Let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. So that's what he says in verse 13. He says, go and see where he is so that I may send men and seize him. And he was told, he's in Dotham. So see, he sent horses and chariots and a powerful army there. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. See, Elisha picked a battle with this guy when he started foiling his plans. And this battle that Elisha picked has now created some pretty serious repercussions. Because now trouble is brewing and problems are coming. That's where, that's where we are here in this story. I, when you pick a fight, trouble starts to brew and problems start to come. And the thing that's really tricky about this is that we don't see them coming. Elisha and his servant, as we'll find out, they don't know that this trouble is brewing and the problems are coming. The problems that are coming to Elisha and his servant, not while they're sitting in the army of Israel, but while they're in like Dotham, like hanging out, they're at Pineland's Club down the road. You know, kids are in the pool having a good time. That's where they are. 
And nighttime falls and what they don't know is happening is there is an entire military army coming to them. There is a serious problem that's coming in the night. And that's when our problems come. It's when we think that we're okay. It's when we let our guard down. It's when we sleep at night. That's when bad dreams come. If you're having bad dreams during the day while your eyes are open, there's a bigger problem that's happening with you. But that's when our bad dreams come. That's when our deep thoughts come. But guys, it, if, you're, if you're living a life where you're saying, I'm going to pick this fight, I'm going to choose to fight, I, I'm okay with getting punched in the face, I'm okay with feeling like it's an unwinnable battle because I'm trusting that what Chris is saying through Jesus, that what Jesus is saying to us as a church is that this is a winnable fight. I do just want to prepare you that in the background, trouble is brewing and problems are coming. And I'm, I'm not doing this to scare you away. I don't want to scare you off of this. I, I, I don't, but I also don't want to like feed you a whole bunch of like prosperity gospel and say that, hey, if you just choose God, then all your problems are going to go away and be taken care of. Because you know what? That just means that God is like super small. I don't want to serve a God that doesn't have to solve my problems. And the bigger my problems are, the bigger that my God has to be. The more that I need God, the more blessed that I am to need God. So if you choose this fight, if your marriage is worth the fight, if overcoming your addiction is worth the fight, if uh, learning to love yourself is worth the fight, then problems are coming and trouble is brewing. But that is okay. Look, look at where, we, we go back to Elijah and his servant. So we, you know, we don't want to manipulate the Old Testament you know, to pull something out of it that's not there. But I promise that we can identify with what's happening between Elisha, especially his servant. Elisha picks a battle. Problems are coming, trouble's brewing, and they have arrived. The sun is coming up. Elisha's servant wakes up, go outside, use the restroom, put a, uh, some tea on the kettle. And while he does that, in verse 15... The servant of the man of God, he got up early and he went out, went out, you know, thinks he's going to just, you know, have a nice relaxed morning. And instead, behold, you know, that, that, that behold, that, that's that moment where, where, where you realize that you are surrounded by trouble. That's the moment where you realize that you're in deep, where you realize that the problems have come. That's that, you know, I, behold. And so, and behold, there was an army with horses and chariots encircling the city. Not encircling the army, not encircling uh, Israel's army with Elisha tucked neatly in the middle of it. No, 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 no. This is just Elisha and his servant in the little town of Dotham, all of a sudden circled by thousands and thousands of elite army warriors from Syria. And Elisha's servant says to him, oh no, which I think is an appropriate response. Oh, no. You know? He just went outside to tinkle and put on the kettle. And instead, behold, oh, no. My master, what are we to do? See, God, I, I want to catch you right here in your oh, no moment. So instead, you should be saying, oh, no, what am I to do? You know, I, if you haven't chosen to pick a fight... If you've not chosen, you know, someone to fight for, then it's going to come. And when it does come, you're going to find yourself in this spot of, oh, no, what am I to do? I've th I thought this like three times this week. The number of times that I think this in a month is just mind boggling. But I'm not any different than any of you. We think this all the time. Oh, no, what am I to do? I'm fighting for having uh, healthy finances. Guess what's going to happen? The moment you decide to fight for your finances, I, you couldn't make a list long enough of the things that are going to break in your household. Oh no, what am I to do? You fight for your marriage and, and I, things are going to come up out of the woodwork. You're going to find yourself in a spot of, be, look, behold, oh no, what am I to do? See, I, I, if you're going to choose to fight, I, here's what I need you to do. I need you to get to this place. I need you to say, oh no, what am I to do? It's part of the process. You can't avoid getting punched. You can't avoid feeling like it's an unwinnable battle. But there's solutions to all of those. There is a solution 
to the, oh no, what am I to do phase, but you've got to get there. You got, you got to say, okay, I'm going to, this is worth me fighting for. And now, oh no, what am I to do? Some of you thought that this morning or last night, oh no, what am I to do? In fact, some of you haven't had a day for months where you haven't obsessively worried and thought about this. Oh no, what am I to do? Then in verse 16, Elisha, the man of God, the guy that, that, did the, that, that healed you know, all the water, that floated the ax, that did all these things. Elisha answers, do not be afraid. Okay, great, you know, sure thing, buddy. And he says, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. You know, amen, amen. But I tell you what, and as Elijah's assistant right now, I'm blowing garbage out of the side of my mind. I'm like, whatever. Because right now, buddy, I see you and me, master, and I see thousands of them that are around us here. You know, and we, we are, we are the servant all day, every day. Our problem is, is that we don't have an Elisha in our life. And so what Elisha is doing here is he's recognizing where this guy is in his fight. He's recognizing where he is in his battle, that he's in a, oh no, what am I to do kind of moment here. And he says, you know, don't be afraid. There's more that are with us and are with them. The servant doesn't see it yet. So what he does, and I, I hope that you have an Elisha in your life, or if you don't, you can find one here. But look at what he does in the next verse, in verse 17. Then Elisha prayed. He interceded for him. That's what it means to pray for somebody else. And he prays, and he says, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold. There's that behold again. That's like, whoa, the moment has changed. It was Behold, now we're in trouble. And now it's behold, look at the glory and the magnitude of God that you didn't even know was there. His eyes are opened and then all of a sudden, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire surrounding Elisha. All of a sudden, this guy saw something unbelievably magnificent. And when he saw this magnificent thing, everything changed, but he had to have his eyes opened. He had to see, he had to have an intercessory prayer. He had to have somebody that would pray for him when he couldn't see it himself. And, and just so that you understand what, what's behind all of this, uh, Elisha here, the, the, the angels, the angels have this, this really annoying thing of being absolutely terrifying. And so when he sees the angels, this is what he's seeing. I've got 10, ver I just picked 10, 10 times in the Bible. Every time an angel appears, guess what they say? There's a phrase that comes from it. In Luke, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid. In Luke 2.10, the angel says to the shepherds, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. In Matthew 28.5, the angel to the woman at the tomb, the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. Are you getting a th the theme here? These, these angels, put the picture on the screen for them again. These things are terrifying. They, they are powerful. They are magnificent. I, you know, I, I can go on and, and Daniel, an angel says to Daniel, he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. In Revelations, when the risen Christ to John, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I was dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, do not be afraid. Genesis 15, 1 to Abraham. After this, the word of the Lord came in a vision and said, do not be afraid. Joshua 8.1, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, is what the Lord of the angels said to Joshua. You know, and this is the same group of angels that took Elisha up into heaven. You know what that tells me is that they never left. See, I don't know how to explain it to you more. I don't know how to open your eyes up to this more, but my, my prayer to you is the same as Elisha's prayer for his servant, is that do not be afraid but you have the most feared army in all of creation that is surrounding you, fighting for you. So that thing that we fight for, that thing also has this magnificent army that's fighting with you. And so, I, guys, 
whatever you're up against right now, do not be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. You feel like you've been hit in the face. You feel like uh, you're in an unwinnable battle. You know, what, what, the, the angel showing up for Elisha was not a one-off situation. At my house every single night, when I put my kids to bed, you know what I pray with my kids? I say, Lord, thank you for your army of angels that sit on our fence and surround our property. I thank him for it every night. When we drive, we pray and we say, Lord, thank you that you protect us, that you love us, but surround our car with your army of angels. You know, I, I pray for you guys. I speak that over you when I'm here praying for you or I'm at home praying for you. But we, because of who we have that fights for us, still to this day, because of what we have, we do not have to be afraid. And then out of this, what ends up happening here, and I don't actually have time to unpack it as much as I would like to for it, but I want to give you closure to how this story ends because it's, it's pretty incredible. So let's, let's just finish the story off here in verse 18. When the Armenian, Armenians, the Syrians, so uh, this is how this actually plays out. When they come down to take Elisha and his servant, Elisha prays to the Lord, please strike this people, this nation with blindness. You know, he told his servant, open his eyes, and he told God, close theirs. And the Greek for this is that there would have been a, a huge flash of light that would have blinded them. It would have ruined their vision. It wasn't just that everything went black. It was, a, it was an explosion of light. Their vision would have been ruined. And so now that that's ruined and God sticks them with, with blindness in accordance with Elisha's request, then in verse 19, Elisha says to the Armenians, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me. And I will lead you to the man whom you are seeking. And then he led them to Samaria. So then he leads them into the middle of the hornet's nest, the, the, the army of Israel. So these guys come down to attack Elisha. He strikes them blind and just leads them right into the stronghold of his city. And he says, king of Israel, here you go. And these guys follow him right there. And now he tells them, don't kill them, take care of them, feed them, send them out on their way. And that would end up buying Israel years and years and years and years of prosperity. And it would, it would uh, prolong their existence before they would be attacked again. So God was working. He was doing amazing things there. But I want you to look. It, for you, this is simple. I'm going to be your Elijah. I'm gonna, I'll be that for you. For the month of February and, and on, I'll be your Elijah. I'll, I'll wake up every day, all day long and every night, and I'll pray and I'll ask God to open your eyes so that you see that what is for you is greater than what is against you. So that when you have the hard moment, when you get punched in the face, when you feel like it's an unwinnable battle, that your eyes are open and you see that you're surrounded by God. And you are surrounded by his angels and he is there to take care of you. And that it is not an unwinnable battle. You are never alone on the battlefield if you're fighting a battle for or with God. Or one that he supports. So I want to leave you with this. Closed eyes. They're either going to leave you paralyzed with fear. Or running straight into deceit. So the closed eyes of the servant left him paralyzed with fear. The closed eyes of the army just ran them head first into deceit and then they were taken and they were led right into Israel but an easy way to get to not be either one of these is just to have your eyes open so I'm going to pray for that so this morning I'll tell you this every week uh, we're about to enter into a time of worship and the thing that I'm going to pray over every single one of you this morning is that prayer Lord open their eyes so that they can see that what is for them is greater than what is against them. And then I'm going to let God work in this moment of worship here. And that may mean that you want to take communion because we offer that in the back. It may mean that you want to light a candle because we offer that in the back. It may mean that you just want to sit quietly in your chair. That's also okay. No problem at all. But you may also see something spiritually or with your own eyes that's greater than you've ever seen before. And I think I would just pray that as God opens your eyes, that you see that the fight, that you're either afraid
afraid to be in or the one that you are in is not an unwinnable fight. Because we, the victory is already won. We've already got that victory. It's just time to claim it. So let me be your Elisha and pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray that this is a moment that's not behold, oh no, but is instead behold, wow. I pray that in this room, everyone's eyes are opened. That if, if, if we have willing eyes and willing hearts, all you have to do is be willing. You don't have to even believe in this all the way, but if you can just say in your heart, in your mind, or even whisper out loud and say, Jesus, I'm willing, then Father, open their eyes and let them see what you're doing around them. Let them see the magnitude of the army that's fighting for us. Let them see the beauty of it. Let them see that these are serious, serious, angelic warriors that fight a serious fight. We don't have to be strong because we have chariots of armor and fire and horses that are on our side because Jesus gave his life for us. And so I speak the authority of the name of Jesus over everybody here, that everybody here knows that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, that he died for them, that he forgave them of their sins, and they will never lose 